What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. I'm your host, Josh. I'm joined in the studio by my co-host, Austin. Hey, man. How's it going? Doing well, doing well. And our producer, Daniel. How's it going, man? How's it going, everybody? We're back with another dark story for you today. This one is very, very tragic. It is essentially the destruction of an entire family, the Gilbert family to be specific. But if you're not familiar with Sarah Gilbert and her case, or maybe you've heard of Shannon Gilbert in more recent news, if you've been following the Long Island serial killer or the Gilgo Beach serial killer, Rex Hurman, you may have heard of Shannon Gilbert before. Her case is still technically unsolved, right? Yep. But many people believe she was a victim of Rex Hurman. And really, had we not found Shannon Gilbert, we may never have found and ultimately arrested Rex Hewerman and the long list of killings that that he did over the years. So this episode is really diving into multiple cases. Shannon's is a part of this story as well as the case of Sarah Gilbert, who is currently serving time or the absolutely brutal murder of her mother. So this is a parasite, which doesn't happen all that too often. No, it's pretty rare. And um, we'll get into it a little bit later. But in this case of parasite, this is uh, one of the most rarest forms. Um, and we'll we'll get into, we'll do a little deep dive into parasite and what uh, what statistically is more likely to happen in those scenarios and how Sarah Gilbert kind of uh, is not, you wouldn't suspect her to uh, do something like this. Yeah, I think I think this case is really about understanding this family and how did we get from where the family started to where ultimately things kind of come to an end. It's It's a tragic story and many people are really trying to wrap their heads around how could Sarah do something like this to her mother. And obviously, mental illness plays a major factor in this case, as does drugs, but also just a long history of trauma. And, you know, there's a lot of people that believe that Sarah Gilbert is just pure evil and just a cold-blooded killer at the end of the day. She knew what she was doing. She planned this out. Other people argue a little bit differently and think that she's just insane um criminally insane her lawyer did plead uh insanity in her case so there's a lot of sort of controversy when it comes to to sarah and how this whole story ends up but we're not going to waste any more time here at the beginning because we got a lot of ground to cover so let's just go ahead and dive in to the story of sarah gilbert Sarah Elizabeth Gilbert was born on January 17, 1989 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Her mother was Mary Gilbert, and not much is known about her father other than he was a heroin addict, but Sarah spent her early childhood in an unstable household, and her parents separated when she was just three years old. She had three sisters, Shannon, Cherie, and Stevie, and when they were growing up, Cherie described Sarah as, quote, the goofy one. Shannon was the, quote, leader and talented, and Cherie was a cool and sassy one. After the separation, her mother took Sarah and her sisters and moved to upstate New York. They found a place to live in Ellenville in the Catskill Mountains. Mary worked a few different jobs for the next few years as a retail manager, teacher's assistant, and even an employee at Walmart. Her next partner, the father of her youngest daughter, Stevie, was later arrested for domestic violence. So you're already seeing there's a lot of just trauma and horrible things happening in the family home. There's, you know, major instability here, and that always just makes it tough for for kids growing up, right? It's just it's a rough place to, to grow up. Yeah. Her children, including Sarah, spent nearly two years in foster care after this. Later, Sarah returned to live with her mother, but Shannon continued living in foster care for some time. And, you know, I've dove into the foster care system a little bit, and there is, unfortunately, just so much trauma and abuse that happens um it's kind of mind-boggling when you when you really look into it 
I think a lot of people um, abuse the system just to get, because uh, you can kind of make money on the foster care system depending on how many kids you're taking care of. Some people are in it for just because they're genuinely Absolutely. good people, but yeah, some people just use it to abuse the system. Which is extremely unfortunate. And also just the systems that oversee the foster care system right. are horrendous. Like it is a very broken system. When Shannon was 12, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And when she returned to live with her family, she never got along with Mary's new boyfriend, Rick Werner. Rick often convinced Mary to send Shannon back into foster care. Rick also sexually assaulted Sarah and Shannon at some point in their childhood, and he intimidated them into silence. Mary later went to police to report the abuse when she found out, and subsequently Rick ended up in prison, where he belongs. According to a friend of the family, Mary also suffered from mental illness, and when Sarah was an adolescent, it's reported she began hallucinating and hearing voices, which is never a good sign. By 10 years old, she struggled in school and her grades began slipping. As for Shannon, she was in foster care in a more stable household, and she ended up graduating high school early. She had big dreams of becoming a performer in New York. Meanwhile, Sarah was trapped at home. She actually had an abortion at 14 and dropped out of school at 16. She then moved in with her 22-year-old boyfriend, Emmanuel Martinez, who went by Manny. His primary income was from selling drugs. This relationship became so problematic that Sarah ended up spending many nights in domestic abuse shelters. Eventually, she finally left her boyfriend and returned home to live with her mother, Mary. Sarah began to rely on Mary financially as well. And during these years, tensions were very high. Sarah and her mother rarely got along, but Sarah did end up giving birth to her son in 2009, and Mary loved being a grandmother, which helped the family's relationship heal. But also around this time, family members claimed the relationship between Mary and Sarah got worse with Sarah's drug abuse, and she continuously moved in and out of her mother's home over the years. Around May 2010, circumstances made Sarah and her mother grow extremely close. Sarah's sister, Shannon, then suddenly disappeared. So Shannon Gilbert was Sarah's oldest sister, and she was born October 24th, 1986. She had big dreams of becoming a professional performer, but unfortunately she never made it in New York. In adulthood, she began working as an escort to make some money, and she would find her clients through Craigslist, which was popular at the time. She also lived in Jersey City, New Jersey, but she would come home about twice a month and her family noticed she was wearing nice clothes and jewelry, and she ended up helping her mother out financially because she knew her family was struggling, so she was just willing to help out. And Mary was aware of her daughter's lifestyle, but she still supported it. The last time Shannon spoke to her mother was April 30th, 2010. They made plans for Mother's Day, and it was also around Sarah's son's birthday. And so they were just going to plan one event together, but obviously Shannon never made it. And the last text Mary sent Shannon was, quote, be safe. And Shannon replied, quote, I always am. In the early morning hours of May 1st, 2010, she traveled from Manhattan to meet a client named Joseph Brewer, who lived in Oak Beach Association in Long Island. Shannon was driven to Oak Beach by her personal driver, who was named Michael Pack, and after being at Joseph's home for a little while, something happened that made Shannon dial 911. And here's the beginning of that phone call. State Police, Trooper Fry. State Police. Yeah, there's somebody asking me. I'm sorry? There's somebody asking me. Where are you? There's somebody asking me. Okay, where are you? There's somebody asking me. Where are you, ma'am? I don't know. You're driving right now? No, I'm inside the house. I'm sorry? I'm inside the house. What house? I don't know. Can you trace where I am? I'm sorry? Can you trace where I am? No, I can't. What's your callback number you're calling from? Huh? What phone number are you calling from? Somebody's asking me. Please. Are you in Suffolk County or Nassau County? Um, I'm in Long Island. Where on Long Island are you? Now, as the call keeps going, nothing really becomes more clear, but you can hear the voices of Joseph Brewer and Michael Pack in the background, and it's 
a little bit hard to hear, but they're trying to speak with Shannon. And here's here's more of that audio. No. 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 No, stop. No. Where in Long Island are you? In Suffolk County? Nassau County? Huh? The audio gets really hard to hear, but Joseph is telling Shannon to leave his home. And her driver, Michael, was also trying to get her back in the car so they could just go back to Manhattan. And her driver, Michael, was also trying to get her back in the car so they could head back to Manhattan. Uh, Meanwhile, the 911 operator was trying to get Shannon's location. And this goes on for a bit. Here's more of that phone call. Why are you calling me by my name? Why? Can you on the line? Stop. Please stop it, please. Please stop. Please, please. 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 The more this call is difficult to hear, but there's obviously arguing going on. Both the men present are trying to get Shannon to leave the house. It's not exactly clear why she feels in danger, but obviously she called 911. Uh, Shannon then ran from Joseph Brewer's house towards another house owned by a man named Gus Coletti. And he was about one fifth of a mile down the street. And while running through the neighborhood, this is when Shannon begins screaming. And she's still on the line with the 911 operator. very distressing to listen to yeah it does seem like something scared shannon to the point where she felt like her life was in danger that she takes off running and i don't know if it was something that uh joseph brewer did or it kind of seems like they were just trying to get her out of the house get her back in the car and there's they're obviously like struggling with her maybe trying to like forcefully put her in the car and then she breaks loose and starts running right but it's still a mystery as to what what happened that yeah. caused her to to do this. So Gus then invites Shannon into his home to get her to safety and try to understand better what's going on. Meanwhile, she was still on the line with 911 but wasn't communicating with them. And after 23 minutes, the call ended. She was pounding on my door yelling for help. Help me, help me, help me. I came to the door, I opened the door and she stepped in. And she just stood there tell, yelling, help me. And she had trouble standing on her feet. She was a little wobbly. And I realized that she had a problem and I wasn't gonna be able to solve it. So I called 911 right away. As soon as I told her I called the police, they were on their way, she took off again. That's the last anyone's ever That's, seen her. Yes. Another neighbor, Barbara Brennan, called 911 and explained that Shannon was banging on her door and she believed she was in danger but didn't want to let her into the house. So Shannon continued running through Oak Beach. Gus was also concerned, so he ended up calling 911 as well. And what happened after this is still a mystery. Police later believe she might have stumbled into a marshy area with 12 foot tall reeds east of the Oak Beach Association neighborhood where she had been seen running through. And during a preliminary search of that area, they were unable to locate her. The entire Gilbert family was very active in the search for Shannon. And Mary later claimed that police didn't take the case seriously enough at first. In 2011, she told the New York Times that her daughter's case was ignored because Shannon was in sex work. She said, quote, I think they look at them like they're a throwaway, which totally understand that statement because we see it all the time. Yes. Where police just don't take 
these victims seriously. Yeah. I remember the Willie Pickton case. Do you remember that yeah, one? Yeah. He was just picking up sex workers who were also usually people of color, indigenous people. And yeah, they just, police just didn't care. And yeah. Was dozens, dozens of women. And, and this was a really rampant issue back in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, especially. Yeah. But even today, it's still a major issue. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit and felt like you're climbing up Mount Everest in some flip-flops? Yeah, we've all been there. But here's a breath of fresh air. Fume. It's not about giving up, it's about switching up. And Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. I am obsessed with this Fume device. And if you've never heard of this before, listen up. Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it? Instead of bad, Fume is good, and it's a habit you're free to enjoy. It makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your Fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. I was actually very skeptical about this device before I tried it, but I've been using it for the past week or so, and I absolutely love it. So basically it's a wooden device. It's got a mouthpiece on it. It feels very good in the hands. It doesn't emit any vapor. Every time you take a draw off your fume, you absolutely get blasted with whatever little flavor cartridge, I guess. I don't, I don't know how to really describe it. It's like a little flavor pod that goes inside of the fume. And as you draw air through it, it's running it through this little pod and you actually taste whatever flavor it is. I've been rocking the crisp mint the last week or so. I just love mint flavors. And I was actually shocked at how much flavor they're able to pack into the air you're taking in. Plus the device itself is very well made. It's made out of like solid wood and metal. Feels well constructed, well designed. It looks nice. And you know, you can just take it wherever you wanna go. The best way to describe the flavor I'd say is like an herbal tea. It's got definitely got that sort of smell and taste to it. If you were to steep some mint tea, that's what you're getting when you're drawing through the fume device. Start the year off right with a good habit by going to tryfume.com slash lights out and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use our code lights out to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Again, go to tryfum.com slash lights out. Seven months after her disappearance in December 2010, authorities used dogs that sniffed out a body at Gilgo Beach. And this wasn't far from the Oak Beach Association where she was last seen, but the body they found wasn't Shannon's body. Not long after, they came across three more bodies in the same section of beach. None of them were Shannon, but they all had one thing in common. All of them had been sex workers who found clients through Craigslist. We'll address these victims a little bit later, but meanwhile, the search for Shannon was still very much active. Here's an interview with Mary in May of 2011, about a year after her disappearance. The mother Mary has endured a tortuous 12 months, waiting for news about Shannon's whereabouts and her fate. She took the picture, and then she had given it to me for Mother's Day 2009. And that was the last Mother's Day you spent with her? That was the last Mother's Day. That was the last Mother's Day. When we spoke, she was supposed to come down for last year's Mother's Day and have a show. Mother's Day comes around again tomorrow. Yeah, it's gonna be sad. It's gonna be really sad. But, uh, let's hold on to this. And as always, Mother's It's a beautiful photograph. It really is. The last word I said to her was, I want you to be safe. And she says, don't worry, Mommy, I'm always safe. What do you think happened to Shannon? I think someone or more than one person um, could have hurt her. Her last phone call was to 911, lasting 23 minutes long, screaming, help me, help me, 
tried to kill me. And the police never, never got there. And they didn't arrive until 45 minutes later after the call. And she was already gone. Do you think if the police officers arrived earlier, I mean, obviously they were having trouble locating her, but there were two other 911 calls from people in the neighborhood. I always wonder why it took so long for them to get there and maybe if they got there earlier. Yeah. Do you think that would have changed the course of things? Definitely. Well, I think it took the 911 operator a while to even like dispatch the police out there because she wasn't exactly sure where she was located. Right. And if I understand the location oak beach this this neighborhood is a gated community mm -hmm. kind of on like the far far end of the island so I, I don't think it's you know it's a little bit farther to get to it's in a gated community as well but i think it just took a while because the 911 operator was clearly confused about what was going on obviously there's somebody in distress but i don't think they knew which police to send out um so it just took way too long and obviously in that 45 minutes whatever happened to Shannon happened and then she disappeared. And by the time they got there, it is crazy to think that they didn't find her right away. That too. initial search. Like, she yeah. couldn't have gotten that far in 45 minutes. So the fact that it took so long to even, you know, they're still looking for her trying to figure out where she is, you know, even after all this is, is crazy. And that's why I agree with Mary that it's like, it's because she was in sex work that they really didn't care. Because if you look at the maps of this, of Long Island, it's not, it's not like that big. No. And the area where she found wasn't that far away. If you would have just like done a sweep, I mean, I'm no police officer. I'm not getting these search parties together and organizing these things, but it's really not that big of an area. And it's limited because it's, it's like a sliver of, right, of an island, right. right? So it sounds like they really didn't try. So let's hear a little bit more from Mary. Here's her talking about the attraction of the escort lifestyle and the other victims' families as well. She was lured into the idea that you can live a glamorous life, a high life, you could have, you know, clothes and shoes and makeup and jewelry. And they, they showed her the glamorous side and um, not, not the evil side. Mary Gilbert has started a Facebook page where she stays in contact with the families of the young women whose remains were found on Long Island. We speak to each other every day. We support each other every day. And it's a beautiful thing that there's love inside of pain and hurt. It's really sad to think that these women you know, they're just trying to make a better life for themselves. They're just trying to get out of the situation that they're in. And they know that this is one way to do it. They are obviously aware that this is a dangerous line of work. And despite all of this, they are, you know, in so much need of, you know, a better life, more food for their families, and even just like rent and things like that, that they're willing to put themselves on the line to uh, do this sex work and actually. Interestingly enough, um, one of my favorite YouTubers, Tommy G, shout out Tommy G, he does these really great YouTube documentaries. If you've never seen his channel, really good. He actually goes out to a lot of uh, different different places, and uh, he recently just released a whole kind of like uh, documentary on prostitution, and he goes and talks to a lot of sex workers and asks them about you know the danger and things like that, and and it's just crazy to hear you know, firsthand, like the danger that they put themselves in just, you know, just to make some money. And oftentimes it's not to the point of like, we want to live a lavish life or, you know, buy designer handbags or anything like that. It's just a food for their family. A lot of them have kids. A lot of them are just trying to make money for, for rent and things like that. And it really brings up, he brings up this bigger issue of like, should sex work be legal? Yes. Like, why is it not legal? I don't know if that's a hot take, but I've had that opinion for years. It should be legal. It should be regulated so we can keep these women right. safe. So they always say, you know, it's the oldest profession. We've been doing it forever. Obviously, people find value in it. So why have we not legalized this? Thing right. Yet? Well, it's like Nevada. They have legal yeah. brothels. So it's like why it seems like it's more of this like philosophical 
point of view of like, and I mean, it really comes back to like the government wanting to control people's bodies, right? Of Versus course, yeah. allowing us our own freedom over our minds and bodies, mm-hmm. which I'm a strong believer in. We should all have ultimate freedom over our mind and bodies. And the fact that the government thinks they need to regulate that or, you know, prohibit people from doing certain things with their body, especially if it's as long as it's consensual, right? Like sex work, as long as it's consensual, I don't see any issue with it, right? Like everybody should, should be able to do what they want to do with their bodies. And if this was legal and women had this this route that they could go where, you know, it's regulated just like every other industry, you know, marijuana was legal for many years. Now it's re- well regulated. There's you know and it's reduced a lot of the and we figured it out right we yeah. figured out how to do it correctly and there's tax dollars tax tax revenue that's beneficial to the communities like there's a lot of pros that come come from it it disrupts the illegal market as well so it seems like a no-brainer that sex work should be done the exact same way you yeah know what i mean now i'm not trying to be an insufferable feminist here but i think it's i think it's a problem that's deeply rooted in misogyny because it's primarily a, a woman's profession, right? So right. it's how do we, how does the state control women is really essentially the problem with it. And yeah, you can, I mean, you can have a moralistic viewpoint on if it's correct or not, but just you can do that about anything, any service that's uh, available legally, you can have your own opinion on it. But And how does it affect you personally? Exactly. You right? know what I mean? Like yeah. that's that's my argument to people or like, feel, you know, like, religiously or philosophically like right. i think it's wrong it's immoral it's a sin whatever it may be that's fine but it's ultimately everybody's journey right everybody's allowed to make their own choices we have free will for a reason right right and hey christ was uh christ was inviting prostitutes to his table, he was he's so. washing you know washing their feet yeah you know so it doesn't mean you're any lesser of a human being right it's just sad that so many i mean the statistics on sex workers that are assaulted or murdered is is staggering it's over the years yeah and the fact that they found more bodies who were also sex workers right. that these women were just lost and yeah never never looked for i would imagine i just always come back like these are these women are somebody's daughter right and, you know these are a dad's daughter out there and like i just re- think about that from my own own experience of perspective i'm like i just came and imagine worrying about that and like having to fear like my daughter is out there doing this because she feels she needs to do that or that's her choice and yet she's putting herself at extreme risk because i mean unfortunately a lot of the clientele associated with this this line of work may or may not be you know good company especially so. because they know it's unregulated right? right and because of history they also know that the police are more apt to not spend the resources required to solve these cases exactly so it's very unfortunate here's mary's last comment on uh, if she believed her daughter was still out there what breaks my heart the most is how you know what her emotions were what her feelings were 23 minutes screaming to 911 help me help me he's trying to kill me he's after me help me she must have really been terrified are you still holding out hope that Shannon is alive or do you think that's a very remote possibility? No, I, I believe that she's still out there and she's alive. I have to believe that. You know, I'm not going to give up. We're not going to stop looking and stop searching until she's found, regardless how long it takes. We're going to keep looking for her. My last comment on this is you were saying like thinking about how people are, you know, having to worry about their daughters being out there. I think the sad reality is maybe that, uh, unfortunately some of these women don't have people worrying about them. So in Shannon's case, it's, so it's refreshing to see that Shannon did have a family who loved her, who probably put more pressure on the police to keep searching, which uncovered these other bodies. And, um, unfortunately, you know, Maybe there's not enough people out there that worry about these women. Yeah, yeah, it's it's heartbreaking too, you know. As as and just watching her be so hopeful. Yeah, and I totally understand why why she feels this way. But ultimately, Shannon's body was discovered about 20 months after her disappearance in the marsh east of Oak Beach. 
Her personal belongings were also found near her. Between 1996 and 2011, the remains of 11 people were discovered in and around Gogo Beach, which suggested that a serial killer might have been on the loose in Long Island. Shannon's body was found just up the road from Gilgo. So her disappearance really like spurred the police to like do something. And when they actually did do something, they realized like, oh my God, we've had a serial killer operating right under our noses for God knows how long. And there's all these bodies here. I, I wish we could hear from the police and be like, like a real true, honest, like retired. Yeah. yeah. Like somebody off the record who was leading this department be like, how did you feel? I got to wonder if they feel guilt for not being, you know, not taking these cases more seriously and also having a serial killer operating right under their noses and not knowing. I can only imagine the conversations that were being had when they found all these other bodies. Oh yeah. There, there must've been people saying like, we, this is, we fucked up. Yeah, absolutely. But police at this time are still claiming that Shannon might have drowned in the marsh. They said that the tall reeds might have disoriented her and she could have lost her sense of direction, which is a possibility. I'm not going to say it's impossible. And the theory is that she accidentally ran into a trench used to control the mosquito population. She fell and then drowned in shallow water, which eh, seems a little bit less believable if you ask me. Her remains were found in the trench near the Ocean Parkway Road, but her personal belongings were found on the other side of the trench. So that's very curious because it's like, why are her belongings not on her person? Exactly. If she tripped and fell, it would be immediately by you, right? Right. So why would it be on the opposite side of the trench? Which maybe she tripped and fell before, dropped her belongings, then kept running and then tripped again. Sure. It did seem like she's very distressed. She takes off. She's running at a high rate of speed because she thinks somebody's chasing her or somebody is chasing her. So that is a possibility. And I'm guessing they're thinking these things, but why didn't they find her? You know, I know. Right? Like if they know this trench right exists there. out there, like mm -hmm. why wouldn't you like, that'd be the first place to go look for a body is, tunnels trenches and surprisingly it doesn't happen i've seen other cases where a body's been found in like drainage tunnels and they know that in this park there's drainage tunnels yet they don't search the drainage tunnels yeah it's like, they just don't want to spend the money to right. put in the resources to right. do it yeah after the initial investigation the fbi's behavioral analysis unit also said they didn't believe that shannon had been murdered to this day the county police are still open to reviewing new evidence to determine a definite cause of death but with the evidence they currently have, they believe that her death was an unfortunate accident. Which, how do you go to an unfortunate accident when you hear that 911 call? And I think that's what everybody really goes back to is a 911 call. She's clearly, somebody is after me, help me. Yeah. And then she turns up dead in yeah. the trench. And it's like, something happened there. And a lot of people will get into this later too, because a lot of people will say, oh, maybe she was just on drugs, disoriented, right. paranoid or something. But we will we'll dig into uh, the toxicology in a bit here. The Gilbert family's attorney, John Ray, rejected the police's conclusion, claimed they didn't have the evidence to support their theory of a tragic accident, which 100%, like, what is the evidence that supports that? Exactly. You're just, you're just making up this theory and saying that. I mean, I know people can drown in like two inches of water it was May, so maybe the trench was a bit a bit deeper than it normally is. But it, that's just a theory you have. There's no evidence. They also urged the FBI to get more involved in the case because they definitely lost faith in the local authorities there. We're going to play a clip of John and Mary actually appearing in a press conference. We're here today at the site of these terrible crimes because the Suffolk County Police Department is grossly derelict in its duty not only to have investigated these murders properly but also because they failed to protect the lives of these people who are now gone and that is certainly inclusive of shannon there is no doubt from what we know of the evidence that shannon would still be alive today if suffolk county police had actually done their job. But instead, 
the commissioner of police in Suffolk County has acted like he's, he's running a, an investigation like the Pink Panther. Today, I hope this brings us one step closer to finding a killer, but we need help. We no, need help from the public. We need help from the FBI. We need help from your news media. Is all I'm requesting is this. Think of it as if it was your child, if it was your mother or your father or your sister or your brother. How would you feel that someone knew something, someone could help, but didn't want to and they didn't care? Is all that I am asking for my family and on behalf of the other victims' families is please help end my pain and their pain and find this killer before he strikes and hurts and murders someone that you love. Amen. Well said. Yeah. It's also sad that they even have to do these press conferences. It's like they have to like keep doing these because they do several and they have like Sarah shows up on many of these as well. And it's like they have to. Yeah. To, to keep the police's attention, they have to keep doing this. You do. And that's the real reality. And that, that exists today just as it did then. I mean, after talking with a lot of victims' families up until this point, Every single one of them would say that as soon as they would say, you know, if you're in, ever in our shoes or our situation, the first thing you need to do is don't rely on the police to do their job because they don't always do their job. And in most cases that we've seen, they just straight up don't do their job or they do a minimal job. So do your own investigation from the jump. Don't don't sit around and, and hope that the police are going to do what they say they're going to do because oftentimes they don't and keep the case in, in the media as much as you possibly can. And so luckily that's what the Gilbert family, yeah, which is the doing. best thing you can possibly do. And yeah. I mean, really why we do what we do too is like, it's all about awareness. Ultimately it's like keep, you know, cause sometimes it falls out of the mainstream media as well. They'll stop covering cases and then who, who else do you have? And that's where podcasters and, and you know, social media and things like that are a real benefit to to families because it's the only way they can get the word out and keep people aware of uh, of their case it's it's unfortunate that that's the world we live in but um it's very much reality the family then hired dr michael baden a new york city medical examiner to review the autopsy and unfortunately shannon's body was partially decomposed when it was discovered because again it had been lying in a trench but it did show signs of strangulation. The hyoid bone in her neck showed a roughness at the margins, quote, and suggests the victim might have been strangled. Unfortunately, though, it's unclear exactly how she died. I do think that is definitely something to keep in mind because that hyoid bone is really only broken from strangulation, strangulation. or ligature or something around the neck. Yep. There was also a question if Shannon had used drugs that night. I think a lot of people listen to the call and maybe your your first thought is like, it does seem like she's either really distressed or she may be beyond something. Yeah. But the family's attorney, John Ray, claimed that that's how she always sounded. The two men who were with Shannon on the day of her disappearance denied any drug use as well. According to Dr. Baden, quote, no drugs of abuse, including cocaine, were found. He emphasized cocaine because Mary had admitted that Shannon had occasionally used it, but there was no evidence that suggested Shannon died from a drug overdose, natural disease, or drowning. So it doesn't really leave a lot of, a lot of alternatives other than the fact that she was likely murdered. Yeah, and it's strange that they jumped to drowning, yet the autopsy, yeah, you would see water in the lungs immediately, like there would be signs of something, yet there was none. It was just this bullshit theory. Right. And it does make me believe that the, you know, acting medical examiner for the county or whatever came up with different results. So that's what happens too in a lot of cases where there's a suspicious death is that, you know, the the official medical examiner, they do their autopsy and they see one thing and it, you know, the family's like, hey, that doesn't make sense to us. So they'll go hire an independent uh medical examiner and they'll often find something different. So Right. It's hard because they they'll go back and forth. They'll be like, 
you know, well, this is what I saw and I saw the body first. So therefore my results or findings are correct. And then the independent will be like, well, I'm seeing something different. I think just based on the fact that sometimes you do get different results in suspicious deaths, it makes more sense that it should just be part of the the normal process for more than one medical examiner to uh, perform an autopsy. That's like, a good point. Yeah. Like it's get two it's, eyes on Right. This. It's yeah. weird that it's just like one person that does it and then you just kind of have to go with whatever they find. Like I feel like there should be, you know, there's supposed to be checks and balances in our criminal justice system yet when it comes to autopsies, it seems like, like I, there is, a, you know, there's people observing the autopsies, but it's not a pathologist. It's not actually somebody who knows what they're looking at. Right. Oftentimes like the detective or somebody's observing the autopsy and you know, they're the witness and they sign off too. But I do feel like there needs to be more than one doctor and, and maybe it's like in different rooms, you know, separate a little bit so you can get a more subjective look at, at what you're looking, you're actually reviewing. Cause sometimes it's hard to trust those medical examiners. Yeah. Know? Oh man. Note to self, if yeah. I ever have to do this, I'm, I'm hiring another doctor for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That's huge, huge thing to have an independent autopsy done. Sometimes you can't though, because yeah. autopsy or because the bodies, uh, the remains are no, no longer viable for that. But if you can get a second autopsy, absolutely do it because oftentimes you'll find discrepancies there. There's also one more strange twist added to the mystery of Shannon's death. Dr. Peter Hackett, a retired emergency services doctor, also lived in the neighborhood when Shannon went missing. He had called Shannon's mother Mary just after her daughter had gone missing. He claimed he had treated her professionally while running a wayward home for girls. His statements were later discredited by police and they claimed he had nothing to do with the case. He only wanted to insert himself for attention. And actually the Gilbert family went on to file a lawsuit against him because that's just so fucking weird. Like, why are you oh, trying to insert go. yourself? Yeah. This happens a lot too. There's news footage if you're curious about this guy. I didn't want to give him more attention because he already diverted enough from the case. But he's people like from the media approach him. He like fakes having heart issues and stuff. He's He seems like, just a he's a wackadoo yeah. yeah so those four bodies that we mentioned earlier um that were found on gilgo beach just down the road from where shannon had gone missing these were the bodies of melissa bartholomew maureen brainerd barnes amber lynn costello and megan waterman they've become known as the gilgo four and they were found in december 2010 their bodies were found bound with belts or tape and they were wrapped in burlap Many believed these murders were committed by someone they nicknamed the Long Island Serial Killer or the Gilgo Beach Serial Killer. And just recently, a supposed quote-unquote family man named Rex Hewerman, who is 60 years old, was charged with the murders of these women in July 2023, about 13 years after the discovery of the bodies. So this case has been just extremely delayed and very slow. But his DNA has been connected to the burial sites, and he has even pleaded not guilty. He's being held without bail. He's denied everything since day one. Investigators also claim to have found several of Rex's email accounts, which he used to search sex workers, sadistic torture-related pornography, and child abuse material. We're not going to go into extreme detail into Rex Hewerman and his whole background and case in this yeah. episode, because we're focusing on the Gilbert family. But on my other podcast, Mile Higher, we did do a whole pod podcast episode on Rex Hewerman and the Go Go Beach murders um, in great detail. So if you're interested in knowing more about that case, uh, we'll we'll link that episode for you because it's definitely worth checking out. It's, it's, yeah, no, it's absolutely uh, insane. It's also a rare because Mile Higher doesn't often cover serial no. killers, and that was one of the few I yep. remember because it was kind of like, shouldn't this be a Lights Out podcast? But it was like, no, we're it's, it's all on you yeah. guys now every now and then good luck we'll, every now and then we'll we'll do one over there yeah as for mary gilbert she advocated for the theory that shannon was murdered possibly by more than one person and many believe that shannon's killer might have also been rex hewerman but suffolk county police officials have not indicated that they believe rex is a suspect in shannon's death strange enough nikki brass who was a former escort worker later came forward and she claimed she once went on a date with rex hierman and she claimed that rex discussed shannon gilbert's disappearance with her before shannon's body was ever found now they were just kind of shooting the shit and theorizing about this but 
Supposedly, he went on to explain that she was probably killed by a, quote, killing party where people stayed behind at a party, selected Shannon, and then murdered her. Now, it seems odd yeah, to get wild. that specific about, but I guess they were talking about theories, but it is strange. In October of 2023, the Gilbert family lawyer, John Ray, appeared with former police commissioner Rodney Harrison at a press conference. John said he had four witnesses that tied Rex Hureman to two other victims in the Gilgo Beach investigation, and one of these victims was Shannon Gilbert. So Rex was known to use sex workers, and they would sometimes come over to his house, and one of these witnesses that John Ray had found came forward. They were a banker who had a second job as a taxi driver, and in the fall of 2009, which you remember, that's about a year before Shannon went missing, they got a job to pick up a young woman from a house in Oak Beach. Apparently, this woman was locked in a bathroom for safety. They had felt uncomfortable, so the taxi driver was told to flash the lights and beep the horn to let the woman know when it was safe to come out of the house. The taxi driver arrived at the house and did this several times, but no one came out. Suddenly, a giant man, whose figure was similar to Rex Hureman, came out of the house, but he was covering his face with his arms so he couldn't be seen. He then ran over the SUV parked near the house and got inside. The taxi driver continued to honk the horn and flash the lights until a woman eventually came out of the house. She was crying, she was shaking, she looked very upset, but she eventually got into the taxi and this woman was apparently Shannon Gilbert. So there is an eyewitness that is connecting some history between Rex and Shannon. This press conference reintroduced interest into the case and two of the witnesses who spoke with John Ray have signed affidavits since then and their testimony has been turned over to police and the Gilgo Beach Task Force. As for Rex Hureman's wife, Asa Ellerup, who also raised suspicion, her hair was actually found on three of the victims' bodies. Um, she had filed for divorce almost immediately after Rex's arrest. Currently, she is working with her children and Peacock on a documentary about the case, and it's reported that she and her children are receiving $1 million as payment for their involvement in this documentary. So, I mean, this is an entire can of worms. If you're more interested in this case, obviously go check out uh, The Mile Higher. Um, but like we said, this is more about Shannon and Sarah. But this wife has also been accused of still being on good terms with Rex and He's also been seen smiling at her in, in the courtroom, and she's also been accused of only divorcing him for financial purposes and to maintain her public image. Many believe she's using the situation as a money grab, but according to police, she is not an official suspect in the case. As far as my theory on if she knew what was going on, I think there's no way she at least didn't know that Rex Hureman was getting sex workers over the house or something like there's just no way she didn't know about that that's just my opinion on it though but yeah yeah we dive into a lot more of the relationship and i mean this guy was like a family man like kids like you yep. had a really high paying job um very successful he worked in real individual. estate right yeah yeah he was like in uh building um like building buildings yeah, yeah like yeah. that kind of stuff building architecture things like that um in in manhattan right and so there's big a lot money. yeah big money and you know he was definitely fooling around on the side and then but he also has this very dark dark side to him too um yeah it's it's kind of crazy i don't know how i feel about the peacock documentary i'm like uh, yeah it and it feels kind of dollars too. yeah yeah doesn't i don't know it feels icky to me but Supposedly, that's still in the works. Uh, I think they started, or at least they were talking about it last November. So, so we'll see with that one. But at one point, the Gilbert family hired a private investigator and missing person specialist. Her name was Dottie Laster. As of today, Shannon's death is unfortunately still a mystery, and the grand jury investigation of the Gilgo Beach murders is still ongoing. Yeah, it's going to keep on going for a while, too. So let's rewind back to May of 2010 and you know that we're going to go back to the Gilbert family here and specifically what happens next after Shannon disappears. So back to May 2010, Sarah's living on and off with her mother Mary. 
and Sarah had given birth to her son with Manny about a year before. And when police discovered Shannon's body later that year, Sarah's mental health severely declined. The family's private investigator, Dottie Laster, told People Magazine, quote, when your loved one is missing, the torture is too much for family members. They can't eat, they can't sleep. Over time, they develop serious medical malfunctions. She also explained that families who experience a loved one go missing are often traumatized long-term. And it was especially true with the Gilberts. She said, every phone call, every message, every knock on the door is a combination of hope and terror. You don't go back to where you started. It's like a nuclear bomb went off. And this is, there's, this is a very, very true statement. Because interestingly enough, I mean, we, we cover on Mile Higher, we also covered a case, uh, the Matthew Weaver Jr. case. Uh, this young man went missing in the Santa Monica Mountains, and his father, his mental health severely declined to the point where he ended up getting in a shootout with police and is now serving time in prison because he, his mental health, his mental health went, went downhill, started drinking, and he doesn't even remember the incident at all. Uh, but he was mad because the police didn't provide the response that, that he felt they should have uh, for his son. And his son was um, involved with drugs and gangs. Oh, so another man. you know example of how police, you know, they'll expend their resources as they see fit versus they, get, they don't give the same treatment to every single victim, which, right. is, which is fucked up. But the idea of not knowing where your, where your loved one is or what happened to them is the absolute worst yeah, it's a waking thing nightmare. you could think of. Yeah. By 2013, Sarah had several psychotic breaks. She developed severe delusions, believing that her sister Shannon was even still alive. In late 2013, Sarah was watching the American Music Awards on television. She became consumed with the belief that she and Shannon had co-written hit songs for Rihanna, Beyonce, and Jay-Z. And not long after that, she developed a second set of delusions. She believed her family members were possessed by demons or they were evil gods. And she would insist she could tell just by looking into someone's eyes. She also told people she was a god and her job was to defeat all evil gods and that the evil gods often took the form of her sisters and mother. And this continued for years along with her substance abuse problems. So obviously some major mental health problems going on here coupled with substance abuse. It makes sense to me how these delusions just keep getting crazier and crazier. During and after 2014, Sarah was hospitalized in two different facilities in upstate New York. During her first hospitalization, she kept referring to herself as, quote, God. She was supposedly hospitalized for purchasing a knife after believing her own son was an evil God. At this point, she was also diagnosed with schizophrenia. In March 2015, the Gilbert family held a final memorial for Shannon, and the family said their goodbyes. Only a few months later, in August, Sarah overdosed on recreational drugs, and she also refused to take the psychiatric medication that she had been prescribed during her hospitalizations, which is always sad to hear. During all of this, her mother Mary was also focused on what happened to her daughter Shannon, and in the early years after Shannon's disappearance, Sarah was also helping her mother with Shannon's case. She actually traveled with Mary and helped coordinate their schedules. She also appeared in news interviews to raise awareness for her sister. The family's PI, Dottie Laster, said that Sarah seemed like she had it together. She was doing a very positive job and was helpful, but after a while, Sarah's mental health began consuming her life. Forewarning, this next event that takes place does involve uh, the abuse of animals. So uh, if that's very sensitive or triggering for you, I uh, would probably skip ahead here. But in February 2016, Sarah drowned the family's pit bull, Puppy, in a bathtub in front of her five-year-old son. The dog had been a gift from the boy's father, Manny, and Sarah later claimed she thought the puppy was actually Eminem, the rapper, and that it wanted to hurt her. She then took the young boy out into the nearby woods and threatened to kill him. Her five-year-old son then went and told Mary what had happened, and Mary immediately called the police. And we actually have some of the body cam footage of police showing up to that scene. So let's play that now. I had begged my mom not to call the cops because I was afraid that they were going to, you know, remove her son from the home. Sarah? 
officers wow. responded up there. Um, they were uh, immediately greeted by Sarah at the door. Do you have any animals in the in the apartment? Yeah. You've never owned one. Yeah. When did you own an animal? Uh, a dog. When? Re- just recently. I don't have any more. Where is it? I don't know. I ran away. The officers then, uh, you know, saw the garbage bag. They opened it up, and unfortunately and tragically, that's where the uh, remains of the the puppy was. The dog looks like it's dead. So you lied to me? Yeah, it's you. Why did you lie to me? Because I'm evil. Her demeanor is just so. She just seems empty. Yeah, like just straightforward telling the police that. Yeah, no I'm, emotion. Because I'm evil. Right. Yeah. Ugh. So obviously they arrested Sarah and charged her with animal cruelty as well as the endangerment of a child. Just like to do that in front of your own child. I'm just like, oh my God, how traumatizing. And because of this incident, Mary was granted temporary custody of Sarah's son. She met her daughter in prison and explained that sometimes a mother needs to be tough with her love. And the two were seen later embracing in jail. So Mary's just trying to be the best mother she possibly can. She's dealing with horrible, horrible circumstances. She's dealing with the disappearance and murder of her daughter. And now she's dealing with Sarah's has obviously having severe mental health issues, just killed the family's dog in front of her son. And she's obviously trying to figure out how to proceed with Sarah. Um, and so that statement makes sense to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad she went to police and I'm glad that that son was taken out of Sarah's custody. Yeah. It's obviously not a, a safe environment anymore. Yeah. Later in May of 2016, Sarah was arrested again. And this time it was for criminal contempt. Apparently, her ex-boyfriend had an order of protection against her, which she violated. And by now, Sarah claimed she began to believe that her mother was possessed by demons, and she even called her sister, Cherie, to tell her what was going on. The family lawyer, John Ray, later said that this possession was loosely based on truth. As it turned out, Mary had allegedly practiced witchcraft and black magic for most of her life. She had actually dabbled in the occult since she was about 17 years old. So you can kind of see where this influence is coming in with Sarah, evil gods and demons and and all that's all things she's probably heard throughout her childhood. And now that her mother is taking her son away from her, she probably even sees her more as evil. Right, right? exactly, exactly. John claimed that her children were adversely affected by it, so her mother's interest in the occult played into Sarah's delusions of witches, demons, and voices in her head. And that leads us to the morning of July 23rd, 2016. 27-year-old Sarah was supposedly still hearing voices in her head, and she called her mother for help. She had only been out of the hospital for a month, and she was living in apartment number two at 9 Warren Street in Ellenville, New York. Her 52-year-old mother, Mary, lived at the same property, just in a different apartment. When Mary arrived at her daughter's place, Sarah invited her into the living room. According to Sarah, by this point, she was absolutely convinced that her mother was some sort of evil goddess or demon who had come over to harm her. And supposedly, the voices in her head were telling her to kill her mother. Sarah then took a 15-inch non-serrated kitchen knife, which she had actually taken out prior to her mom getting there and placed it under her couch, and then brought it out and stabbed her mother 227 times. She later claimed she stabbed her so many times because, quote, the demon wouldn't die. And after stabbing her mother, Sarah believed that Mary was actually still alive. So she then took a fire extinguisher and bludgeoned her in the head several times. She then pulled the pin on the extinguisher and sprayed the foam into Mary's mouth. The final blow came when she stabbed the kitchen knife into her mother's neck. Some believe that this was an attempt to possibly decapitate her. But after this, Sarah removed all of her mother's clothes and jewelry. According to the autopsy, Mary had 200 or more stab wounds involving the face, 52 stab wounds along the back, and perforation injuries of the heart, liver, lungs, and aorta. This stabbing to me 
just screams somebody who's psychopathic. Like this is a somebody experiencing an absolute psychotic breakdown. Agreed, because we've come across rage killings before and obviously psychotic killings before, but just the sheer number here. I mean, how could someone not have some severe mental illness and do something like this? To your own mother. To your own mother. Who's taking care of your child. I mean, it's just as like, clearly she was not in the right state of mind when she did this at all. Meanwhile, Cherie Gilbert, one of Sarah's sisters, was aware their mother was going over to check on Sarah earlier that day. And at about 1.45 p.m., Cherie became worried when she couldn't reach her mother or sister, so she ended up calling the police and requested a wellness check at Sarah's apartment. When police arrived, they knocked on the apartment's front door, no answer, so they looked through the windows and one of the officers saw what they believed was a body on the floor, and when they entered the apartment, they found Sarah in the home with specks of blood on her face, and they took her into custody. She even told the officers that her mother was, quote, a bad god. And here's some body cam footage that we have of that day. This is insane. In my entire life experience, besides those like Shannon, like. Uh, do I have permission to kick the door in? Sarah. Turn around. What happened? Sarah, stop. Come here. Come here, now. Sarah Gilbert appeared as calm as I do right now um, and um, was standing there. Uh, she was, uh, it was hot. She was sweating. And she had some uh, blood spatter on her face. And um, she very calmly looked at the officers and said, I just killed my mother. You're under arrest. That's when the officers You're took her into custody. Right Here, I gotta check her mother. She's cold. I'm sorry. I under- I'm so sorry. Listen, I understand. But you have your- I couldn't even breathe. <laughs> and when my mom died, I just wanted to crawl in a hole and die. <laughs> I don't want to be talking about this. <laughs> Can we stop for a second? Of course. Sarah was taken into custody. For those who are listening to this, that's Cherie who's being interviewed, and she's also at the scene. That's who you hear kind of screaming and crying as well. But she later posted to Facebook about what happened that day, and she said, quote, Yesterday was the second most devastating day of my life. The first was losing Shannon. I can't believe I'm reliving this nightmare again. My mom, my best friend, the person I relied on most in this world is gone. Mental illness is a serious disease. We tried to get Sarah help many times since she was diagnosed with schizophrenia in early 2014, and she would get better, and then her condition would get worse. So as I said at the top of the episode, we were going to dive a little bit into parasite, not parasite, P-A-R-I-C-I-D-E. So parasite is when an offspring murders their parent or parents. And some of our recent episodes I've noticed, we've we've covered this several times. So I thought, you know, why not do a little dive into this? And a lot of this data, some of it comes from the Parasite Prevention Institute. But So the parent that's murdered is typically the primary caretaker of the offspring, which would be true in Sarah's case. And some parasite offenders can be super young. Some are as young as eight years old. But many of them are between the ages of 16 and 18. And this is also what makes Sarah's case rare. She's 27 at the time of this crime. Another interesting fact is that many of us would assume that the offenders in parasite cases, the people who kill their parents, are abused as children. But actually, in a study of more than 750 youthful parasite offenders, 
only 15% of them were actually reported to be abused. And that was kind of a shock to me. Yeah. I would assume it would be way higher, right? I think that's what most people would assume. Yeah. And in 6% of these cases, the child was actually the ones abusing the parents before murdering them. So Mm. keep that in mind. The motivation for many of these cases is control and or money, you know, one and the same. This also includes disagreements about being grounded or having your phone taken away. Sometimes that's what the straw that breaks the camel's back. The money usually comes from like the parent's life insurance, which we also see in a lot of cases. Or some, they just want money so they can throw a party afterwards. Keep in mind, you know, these are teenagers some of the times and they just throw a massive party and then get arrested afterwards. Smaller motivations are to stop the abuse of self or family. Sometimes it's a fit of anger or they just want a different life entirely. Some speculate that Sarah was upset with her mother because she had taken temporary custody of her son. And so that's kind of the motivation in this case. We're also dealing with a mentally ill offspring. And this is one of the more rare cases for parricide. Sarah's mental illness is kind of up for debate here, which we'll see in the trial. It's it's clear that she has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, but we'll get into it a little bit later, um, specifically in regards to it being a contributor right, right. to her murdering her mother. So we'll save that for a little bit later here in the trial. But another reason this case is so rare is because the perpetrator is female. Usually in parasite cases, about 90% of them are male perpetrators. So her case, in the grand scheme of things here, her case falls into a tiny percentile when you consider her age, her mental illness, and the fact that she's a woman. It's it's uh this is like an extremely extremely rare case wow that's that's insane honestly yeah but sarah gilbert was later charged with second degree murder which alleges that the murder was unplanned but intentional she was held without bail in ulster county jail until her trial and she later pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity during her trial her defense attorney john ray did not dispute that sarah murdered her mother but he claimed that Sarah couldn't be held responsible due to her mental illness. The defense brought in a Manhattan psychiatrist, Alexander Barty, to address Sarah Gilbert's mental condition. He explained that in the year leading up to the murder, her schizophrenic mental state had become, quote, more acute. She had been prescribed medication for her condition, but at some point she had stopped taking them, which made her delusions even worse. It was also revealed that Sarah had been hospitalized seven times for her mental illness throughout her life. On top of this, she had suffered from years of mental and physical abuse, and she had also allegedly suffered from sexual abuse by her mother's boyfriend. Sarah ended up testifying in her trial, which is also rare, and she said that she truly believed that her mother Mary was evil and deserved to die. She claimed she had filled her mother's mouth with fire extinguisher foam to shut off her voice. Then she stripped her mother's clothes and jewelry to remove her power, and she also claimed she could see her mother's eyes grow bigger and her mouth move while she removed the clothes. And it was at that point that she thought her mother was even still alive. At one point, she identified her former boyfriend and the father of her one child, Emmanuel, or Manny Martinez, in the courtroom. She accused him of being the source of some drugs she had used, and Emmanuel said he had been in jail on drug possession charges at the time and did not provide the drugs. Plus, he said he had separated himself from Sarah before the killing. He said, quote, she said she was going to kill me. The girl is crazy. She needs a lot of help. So the prosecution argued that Sarah had been planning the murder for months, ever since Mary had Sarah arrested for drowning the family's puppy and taking her son into temporary custody. Family members also testified, and they described Sarah as a manipulative young woman with a drug addiction, and she often tried to persuade others that her drug addiction was actually her mental illness. So family members also said that Sarah had tormented her mother, Mary, for countless years up until the murder, and I'm curious if this is one of these rare cases where possibly as they got older that Sarah might have been the abuser to her mother. Sarah's youngest half-sister, Stevie, testified, saying that Sarah was jealous of Stevie's close relationship with her mother, and she even said, quote, I believe she would have killed me too. 
So obviously for an insanity defense case, the prosecution knew they would have to prove that Sarah was aware of her actions and knew they were wrong. They pointed out that she hid in the bathroom when police initially arrived at the scene. She also requested that her family be moved away and stated to detectives that she felt bad about her actions. This was when she was being arrested. It was also reported that she had agreed with detectives that stabbing the victim would still have been wrong regardless of the voices in her head. So, I mean, that pretty clearly states she knew it was wrong. A psychiatrist named Sandra Antoniak testified, and Sarah told her that a day before the killing, she heard a, quote, disembodied robotic alien-type voice saying, so, 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 or talk, 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 and also saw a green light and felt rain falling from the ceiling. And she believed that her mother was actually the source of these hallucinations. Sarah also admitted that she stabbed her mother, quote, in the upper chest over the heart because she knew that would be the most lethal place to stab her and that she, quote, wanted her dead. So after analyzing Sarah, Dr. Antoniak suspected that Sarah was actually malingering I think I called it accidentally meandering last episode. It's called malingering. And this means that she was intentionally faking or exaggerating her psychiatric symptoms in hopes of being absolved of criminal responsibility. So Dr. Antoniak then performed what's called the Miller's Forensic Assessment of Symptoms Test, also called MFAST. And this test is meant to help assess the likelihood that someone is feigning psychiatric illness or faking psychiatric illness. Sir ended up receiving a score of five, which indicated to Dr. Antoniak with 97% accuracy that Sarah was in fact malingering, meaning that she was exaggerating her mental illness. Although Dr. Antoniak admitted that her report needed further evaluation with a more comprehensive study, but this was unfortunately never performed. Dr. Antoniak also agreed that Sarah suffered from mental illness at the time of the killing, but she quote, did not lack the substantial capacity to tell the nature and consequences of her actions or that such conduct was wrong. She also testified that Sarah had said that when police arrived at the scene, she knew they were going to find her mother's body. So she got up, went down the hall, felt that her jogging pants had soaked up too much blood. So she took them off, went into the bathroom where she washed her hands and sat in the bathtub. So kind of cleaning up yeah right? yeah and you can see that in the body cam footage she has a different pair of pants on it's, yeah she's wearing jeans or something she's know? smoking a cigarette yeah and, um, yeah this one's really really tough because i don't know I, I feel like she did know what she was doing and the fact that she did get the knife prior put it under the under the couch when her mom came in like that's a there's one. some level of planning going on there for sure you know she had the knife ready to go so that means that at some point prior to that she thought about stabbing her mother yeah and and she admitted in court she's like yeah right. i truly believe that my mother needed to die so and the the plea of insanity i feel like was probably her legal team's approach you know that john was the ray. strategy yeah. john ray's strategy to trying to help his client was like obviously she has mental illness so he's going to really push that you know, as hard as he possibly can, because obviously he, and it seems like he feels truly that way, that she should be absolved of what she did based on her mental illness. But I think all the other factors lead people to feel differently. But in the end, in August 2017, the trial ended a little over a year after the murder. Sarah was found guilty of second degree murder, and she was later given the maximum sentence of 25 years to life in prison. One juror later told the media, quote, We feel that she has a mental illness, but she was aware of what she was doing. Really unfortunate here, and obviously she was mentally ill, but yeah, it's like the evidence kind of stacks up against her that she knew what what was wrong and what was right. Right, and she continued to self-medicate herself with recreational drugs rather than taking her prescribed medications. And also, there is motive here, too. Yeah, They're, with her son. Right. Yeah. And just being angry at her mother. And it's, and it's probably been this built-up resentment for years and years and years. And then finally it took a few 
of these things, you know, her mom putting her into the psychiatric facility and then her mom taking her kid to just kind of like flip the switch yeah. for her and, and send I, her over the edge. I do feel bad also because I know that people who suffer from pretty severe mental illnesses, it's hard to get on the right prescriptions. It's yeah, hard to true. stick with your prescriptions. People have it where you feel better. So you go off your medication because you think you're kind of healed and then you have a downward spiral. Some people think, obviously, like in this case, she felt that self-medicating was a better alternative, but she also suffered from drug addiction. So I get that it's not as just simple as like someone saying like, no, nah, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to do that. It's definitely a complex situation with taking uh, medication when you have some se- severe mental illness. Like yeah. This. Well, and I don't think you can discount the trauma of Shannon's disappearance and death. Right. Right. And just the toll that it took on her family. And, you know, and I can understand from like a sibling perspective, you feel like maybe your mother's spending more time on other siblings. So there's like, it creates a very complex situation and really kind of a perfect storm for for things like this to happen. As I mentioned in my other example with Matthew Weaver's family, too, it's like, right. I, I don't, I just don't think you can put a, like, unless you've been through this kind of, situation before with a missing or murdered loved one like there's just no way for us to really know what it's like to deal with that sort of pain and loss and and how it affects you mentally like i have no way of knowing how something like that would affect me mentally Um, i like to think you know i'm i'm pretty good most of the time but like i've never had anything to that magnitude happen to me so i wonder if that were to happen to me how that would affect my mental health And, and i can only imagine that it would cause anybody's mental health to take a downward turn yeah agreed so it's it's really hard to sit here and like judge right right like um, you know cast judgment on anybody i think ultimately you know she she did what she did and i think there's enough evidence there to back up the sentence that she ended up receiving and what the jury came back with i think that was I, I don't have any issue with that yeah, at all. Same. I think they proved that she knew what was wrong. And she even kind of admitted it when yeah, police exactly. Up, so, but let's hear from her attorney, John Ray, and get his thoughts on her sentence. Well, I had wished that the sentence would have been lighter, given the circumstances of this girl's uh, awful life as she was raised as a little child, as you heard me say. And so um, we will appeal. I've already filed a notice of appeal here today. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do something about the sentence as well as about the fact that she was found guilty because this girl is not right. She never was. There's something wrong with her mentally. She is not competent. She's not responsible for what she did. That's always the case. It remains the case now. The only reason she can even speak the way you hear her her speak in court is because they have heavily dosed her with medications. Always the case with mentally ill. The medications that she's on are so heavy that they completely alter the state of mind of the person who takes them. That's what happened to her. She, She doesn't have any rational understanding of what's going on. It only appears that way because she's stoned out of her mind with drugs given to her by the state. And you know that affects, it even affects the way you walk. It affects your your inability to cry. It affects your inability to even have moisture in your mouth. That's what happened. Mm, That's very interesting. Um, Yeah, it's, ah, there's just no good ending to this whatsoever you know it's tragedy all around for this family i mean i just i feel so bad for sheree and the rest of her her family members and just like to have now both sisters gone in different ways and your mother murdered and especially in this way it's just uh it's just uh, uh, the fact that she was there at the scene it's just like ah just the trauma is beyond describable yeah i just feel so bad for for her and her family and that they have to continue continue life with with this is just yeah so obviously we wish sheree the best out there 
Absolutely. Any thoughts, Danny? Nothing that hasn't been said. This is just yeah. tragedy all around. Absolutely. But lastly, her defense still claims that she was not responsible due to mental disease or defect and that the county jury improperly rejected her defense. In 2021, Sarah's appeal for a new trial was also rejected, and she's currently serving her time in state prison and will be up for a chance at parole in 2041. So quite a long time from now. But that is where we're going to leave you guys today. Let us know your thoughts on on this case. and And also, you know, do you feel like punishment was just in this case? Let us know your your thoughts on what happened to Shannon as well. I'm curious to hear what you think out there. But we will see you guys next time. As always, make sure you subscribe. You're watching on YouTube, listening on Apple Podcasts, or following us on Spotify. We really do appreciate it. But until next time, lights out.